Chapter One of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. Chapter One The Family Gathering. Daisy Bryant sat on a low chair in front of the fire, staring into the blaze her hands were folded idly in her lap and her eyes had in them a look which the others called far away daisy was thinking she did a good deal of thinking for a girl only eight years old the chair she sat in was a little old-fashioned splint bottomed one whose legs had been cut off on purpose to make it a comfortable height for daisy's little legs when they were shorter than at the time of which i write Daisy still liked the chair very much, and always sat in it when she was thinking. The other furniture in the room matched Daisy's chair. That is, it was neither newer nor nicer in any way. There was not a great deal of it. The floor had a neat strip of rag carpeting over in the part which Daisy called the study. There was also a little square table over there, with the Bible on it, and Daisy's geography, and Ben's arithmetic, and a tiny basket that held Line's crochet work. At first Daisy had objected to the crochet work, that it did not belong to a study, but one evening, in the very middle of Miss Sutherland's study table, what did she see but a fluffy ruffle with Miss Sutherland's needle set in its hem, and her thimble lying beside it? since that time the crochet basket had held peaceable possession in front of the stand was a high-backed chair also of the old-fashioned kind it used to have arms but one of them had been broken in moving and one day the other slipped out of place and fell on the floor what miss bryant said when she saw it was now if those rods which used to support the arms were taken out that would make a good sewing chair so ben took the rods out and a sewing chair it became ben had also contrived a neat little place under the stand into which mrs bryant's work basket would fit that work basket was really a sore trial to daisy she felt very sure it ought not to be part of the furniture of a study but of course mother must sit with them in the long winter evenings and part of mother's life was that never empty basket one day a bright thought came to daisy or rather to ben they have waste baskets in studies always i guess miss daisy said looking thoughtfully at the offending basket at least miss sutherland does and i suppose they all do i can see how they would need them but then yours isn't a waste basket is it mother i don't know about that ben had said just as the last quarter of his slice of bread was going into his mouth i think there's a good deal wasted out of my stockings by the time they are popped in there the pair i wore last week were wasted so badly that my two big toes were nothing to speak of the last two days and i should say there was considerable waste to the elbow of your brown dress that went into the basket last night line said reaching for a second baked potato then deciding she would leave it to warm up line was eleven and had to do her share of the thinking daisy turned beaming eyes on her mother there is a sense in which it is a wastebasket after all don't you think so mother seems to be said the mother trying not to smile at daisy's large phrases seems to so you mean mother said ben who was always making puns to spice the dinner with he sometimes told line when they were having an unusually dry meal then they all laughed and the question of the waste work basket was comfortably settled the study had almost no other furniture of its own unless a pleasant window where the afternoon sun shone in and lovely sunsets exhibited may be called furniture it had a neat white curtain made of the better half of a sheet the other part having wasted away in the evening when the work was done daisy's low chair and line's green painted wooden one and ben's from which the back was gone moved into the study where the arithmetic and geography and sometimes a spelling book held close attention 
lines swift fingers weaving her web of crochet while she studied daisy had dreams of a different study from this she never peeped into miss sutherland's on the hill whither she was often sent on errands either to take home the new strip of crochet work or the pile of fresh handkerchiefs her mother had ironed but she told herself one of these days we'll have a study just like this hammock and all for one of the things which especially took her fancy was that lovely gold-coloured hammock which swayed gracefully to and fro with miss sutherland looking lovely in her white cashmere wrapper lounging in it book in hand the two great cottages of chairs which were always in this room daisy decided should be one for mother and one for company but as for line and ben and herself she could never be quite sure just what sort of chair would be the best to read and study in i don't quite like the cottages for studying she would say reflectively because you see they are so soft and fluffy that all i want to do when i get into one is curl up in a nice ball and think and i can't ever study well when i want to think there was a shout of laughter over this and ben said that because daisy did her studying without any thinking must be the reason why she always wanted to spell believe e i instead of i e but mrs bryant took daisy's part declared she understood her perfectly and that she did not think miss sutherland's cottages were good chairs for studying so that matter was still unsettled as to the part of the room where daisy sat which did not belong to the study there was a cook stove which at this moment was aglow not so much because the day was unusually cold as because mrs bryant needed some irons heated just right for very fine ironing her table and ironing board occupied quite a large space certain shelves ranged along the wall held all the dishes the small house owned and these were hidden from dust behind neat calico curtains drawn close for the rest there was another table where the kitchen work was done with the little house under it where the pots and kettles and pans lived curtained in a chair apiece for the four who belonged to the family a beautifully clean floor a bush in the south window that occasionally put forth a red rose that was all poor well mrs bryant and ben and line knew that they were sometimes daisy shrewdly suspected it though the burdens of poverty were kept from her young shoulders as much as possible she knew that their house was very small ridiculously so when compared with the sutherland home in fact i will give you a glimpse of that little cottage as it shrank away from view behind the hill on that november day just a queer little cabin with old-fashioned windows and doors not intended for a house at all in the first place but it had grown into one because of mrs bryant's needs daisy knew that their mother had to work very hard to furnish even this small home with the necessaries of life she knew also that in the busy season line and ben had to work as hard as their mother and as the busy season reached quite beyond the time for the schools to reopen in the fall line and ben had been always behind in their studies which had been a sore trial not only to them but to daisy ever since she could remember because she saw an intimate connection between that and her mother's sorrowful face and occasional tears now you are anxious to know what made the busy season and what sort of work it was in which all even daisy during this last year could help why you must know that mrs bryant lived in a village where there was a large canning factory here were canned all sorts of fruits and vegetables peas and beans and corn and tomatoes and some of the various sorts had a fashion of getting themselves ripe at the same time and of crowding themselves into the factory with a determined air that said take us now or not at all we'll decay we'll sour we'll dry up we'll ruin ourselves in some way unless you give us immediate attention and so true to their word were they that all the village grew into the habit of heeding their warning and peaches were pared and corn husked and the little mill which cut it from the cob was fed as fast as two busy pairs of hands could push in the corn and the great engine wheel whizzed around 
and the great iron furnaces capable of taking care of several hundred cans at once were heated and for days and days people flew around that great building as though everything that was worth caring for in this world was corn and tomatoes and a few such things within the last year daisy had been promoted and allowed to work a few hours of each day in the factory what do you think she did you would never guess in the world i believe so i will have to tell you hour after hour were her small neat fingers kept busy laying shining little tin covers on the filled cans ready for the hands of the man who sealed them on now confess didn't you suppose you could cover all the tin cans there were in the world in the space of an hour or two yet here was spry little daisy working at it day after day ah but you see you don't begin to realize how many tin cans there are in the world when it comes to half a million being sent out from just one factory then you are prepared to open your eyes wide and do some thinking one of the trying features of this business was that it would persist in crowding itself into a few weeks of time making everybody work day and night as though work was all there could be of life and then suddenly shutting down for a long winter when the engine and the furnaces lay cold and still and many of the busy workers found nothing to do it was at this season of the year that mrs bryant's ironing board came into service for work as she would during the busy season to lay up for the winter she found it a trying time harder than usual on this winter of which i write because in the very midst of the busiest season daisy herself had been taken sick and lay very ill for days and her mother had promptly turned away from the drying corn and wasting peaches as though they were of the very smallest consequence and hung over her little daughter day and night and brought her through with good nursing if ever a woman did the doctor had said as he drew on his gloves at that last visit all this daisy knew as well as any of them made this winter harder than any which had been since that one when the snow first fell on her father's grave ben had left school and gone into one of the stores as general errand boy and sometimes clerk when daisy asked him if he had left school for good he answered cheerily why of course Dazelinda. i hope you did not think it was for bad then he had whistled a little to keep a troublesome lump from rising in his throat line too had left school and was doing the most of the work that her mother might have all the more time for fine ironing it doesn't matter so much line had said cheerfully to her mother you see we got so far behind during the busy season that we could not go on with our classes anyway and ben and i mean to study every evening and get ahead of the class by spring and the mother had smiled and said i am blessed in my children and they had all known that she cared very much as for daisy she knew that line cried once in a while when she thought nobody saw her and she knew that the doctor's bill was very long so she thought a great deal during these days and silently gave up some plans that she had hoped to begin to carry out she was resolved that the others should not have all the sacrifice for was she not eight years old among other schemes which she quietly gave up was that one of having a square of carpet with a border to it for the study it had seemed to her that this would be beginning to be a little like miss sutherland's study how much of a beginning it would really have been you might perhaps realize more fully could you take a careful look at the room which was daisy's model but daisy realized fully that more carpet was quite out of the question this year there had been another plan to have a motto for her study and to have it by thanksgiving morning not a lovely painted one like miss sutherland's which had been very lately sent to her and was one of the first things daisy had seen the other day while she waited for the change but one worked on cardboard such as she had seen in the stores such as she knew she could buy for ten cents and the silks to work it for five cents more but where are the fifteen cents to come from 
daisy asked herself with an exceedingly thoughtful face the more she thought the more sure she was that the motto would have to be given up she did not know that any one understood her sacrifice but there were more things understood in that house than daisy dreamed of just the evening before thanksgiving the family were gathered in the study mother sewing as usual ben and line studying daisy thinking suddenly she broke forth mother what are we going to be thankful for to-morrow thankful for repeated the mother in a mildly astonished tone while ben looked up from his book and whistled softly and line laughed but daisy held her ground why yes oughtn't we to think up things and be ready it isn't as though we had a great many you know i think we have a great many and i think thinking them up is a very good idea said mrs bryant as she sewed and smiled the whole family were taken up with the idea ben engaged to do the example in his notebook and the list began you give the first one mother daisy said well in the first place we are all well and all together four healthy bryants wrote ben with a flourish only daisy keeping her gravity the while she was very much in earnest i am thankful for this history said line hugging her second-hand book i thought i should have to make one of my own before i heard of this and one history old as the united states and good as new went down on ben's list for his first item he wrote fifty cents a week explaining that it stood for his promotion in the store by which he earned just so much more a week as for daisy she said promptly a chicken most as big as a turkey it isn't because i want so much she explained with a little flush on her cheek but i like it to be big because it might almost be called a turkey and i like the name turkey very much for thanksgiving it was intensely interesting work more than one exclamation was made over the length of the list mother said daisy hesitating over her turn could you put down something that you hadn't got and be thankful for that of course said ben answering promptly daisy bryant hasn't the smallpox will that do no i don't mean that i don't quite know how to tell what i do mean but mother if you might have had a thing and wouldn't buy it because you thought it was not right to use the money for it wouldn't it be a thing to be thankful for it certainly would said mrs bryant decidedly a prudent mind or an unselfish heart is a great cause for gratitude then ben you may put down for me saved fifteen cents daisy drew a long sigh of relief as though some important matter was settled at this mother and older daughter exchanged glances they knew that daisy's own tin bank contained just fifteen cents the sum of all her wealth which had been accumulating for months and months they knew just how she had been tempted to spend it letting sunday school money and benevolences of all sorts to say nothing of household needs go to the winds ben knew about it too and he leaned over and kissed his little sister squarely on the nose before he made the record but mother and older daughter also knew a delicious little secret which made them smile at each other although there was something in the mother's eyes that glistened presently ben gave a short sharp whistle see here he said how am i ever to get the sum of all these things people and books and chicken and house rent all mixed up together it is compound addition with a vengeance the things won't add suppose you let me do the summing up mrs bryant said as she took the notebook and wrote at the bottom of the page in her neat plain fashion how precious are thy thoughts unto me o god how great is the sum of them if i should count them they are more in number than the sand end of chapter one
Chapter Two of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Delicious Secret. The way Mrs. Bryant and Line had come to understand some of Daisy's wishes was in this fashion: Daisy, in one of her thoughtful hours, had asked, "Mother, what does troth mean?" "Troth," repeated Ben, looking puzzled. "Don't you mean trough?" daisy put down her head on her mother's arm to laugh before she answered she knew what trough meant and felt sure her word was very different tell me how you have seen it used said mrs bryant musing how best to explain the word to her eight-year-old daughter why in miss sutherland's study there is a motto hanging on the wall a new one it was not there last week and it says on it in lovely gold and brown letters keep troth oh said mrs bryant why daisy suppose you and somebody you love very much had promised each other some dear and pleasant thing and your friend to keep you always reminded of your promise should buy or paint for you a motto with those words on it if you understood the words as often as you looked at them they would say to you be faithful to your pledge daisy's eyes were shining why mother she said i think that is lovely couldn't anybody think it was a motto from jesus to remind us of our promises to him it was a very pleasant smile that mrs bryant gave daisy then her little daughter certainly had some choice thoughts i think anybody might she said that is if anybody thought of it and she wondered how many who used the word thought of jesus and the pledges he was willing to exchange with them silence for a few minutes ben had gone back to his arithmetic but he was still thinking of the new word its meaning was certainly very different from that of trough presently daisy prefacing her words with a gentle little sigh which she often used i think mottoes are lovely they seem to belong to studies they fit them a great deal better than pictures i think they say things to you you know well so do pictures some of them but i would just love to have a motto for our study i could make a cardboard one if i had the cardboard but they cost ten cents apiece and then there's the silk the sentence closed with another little sigh that was the first the family heard of the motto but not the last daisy often spoke of it she did not know she thought aloud so much she did not dream that her pitiful little sacrifice at last of her dear plan almost broke her mother's heart then line went to thinking and planning and the mother helped and ben helped and on thanksgiving morning what did daisy's astonished eyes behold when she entered the study but a motto in a lovely frame hanging by a crimson cord in just the right place on the wall peace and plenty were the words which smiled down on her but there was more to the motto than this it was decorated with leaves and flowers and the centerpiece was a figure which daisy promptly named an angel scattering flowers or fruits or something over the land it is true the lettering on this centerpiece spelled september and the month was november that word had been a trial to line and ben for a week they had discussed and abandoned various plans for covering it but daisy after she had exulted over every pretty thing about it had hinted that she plainly saw the troublesome word by saying peace and plenty those just exactly fit thanksgiving don't they and how pretty that word september will be next fall because you know mottoes are for all the year round at which both line and ben had laughed as they kissed her and ben said she ought to be named sunshine instead of daisy where did the motto come from why it was cut out of an old magazine that a boy in the store had given to ben and pasted on the cover of an old box and covered neatly by line with some white satin paper given her at the paper factory and banded with gilt strips which came from the same place as for the crimson cord 
mrs bryant had produced it from a packed away box of long ago treasures it used to belong to an old picture that has faded out now she said with a smile which played around lips that quivered and line and ben handled the cord tenderly and spoke low for the next few minutes but what a joy that motto was to daisy it is so true she said dancing about it gleefully that thanksgiving morning we are just as peaceful as we can be not a bit of trouble anywhere have we mother and as for plenty you know the chicken is very big and you know there are to be mashed potatoes and baked sweet apples and milk and the chicken is to be stuffed just like a turkey i'm sure the motto fits in fact i don't suppose you can understand what the surprise was to daisy unless you love beauty as well as she did and have as few things with which to gratify the taste moreover the motto had a mission it was suggestive the walls of the little cottage were not lathed and plastered were not even painted their weather-stained unsightliness had been among daisy's trials on that very afternoon when the work was all done the kitchen in exquisite order and deserted and the family were gathered at leisure in the study mrs bryant having promised not to sew a stitch because it was thanksgiving daisy gazing at the beloved motto exclaimed mother oh mother why couldn't we cover the walls with pictures mrs bryant laughed you dear little dreamer she said where do you suppose the pictures are to come from and how much paste and time do you suppose it would take oh but i don't mean all at once be a long long time you know and take just a tiny teaspoonful of flour at a time we could afford that couldn't we when we found a real pretty picture anywhere paste it up in a nice place and in a great many months the walls would be covered it was impossible not to laugh at the bright face and dancing eyes and there was something so funny about it to line and ben that they laughed loud and long mrs bryant was the first to recover voice it is a pretty thought she said and i will certainly try to furnish the spoonful of flour for my share but we have almost no chances for pictures darling and i'm afraid you will be old and gray before the walls are covered well said daisy cheerily then i will put on my spectacles and sit down and enjoy them but daisy's ideas were not generally allowed to drop she kept eagerly at hers until the others absorbed a little of her enthusiasm and mrs bryant confessed that she had a picture laid away in a box which she had kept for a long time the box was brought out and its contents turned over and enjoyed it was a queer collection of old half-worn treasures a shoe that belonged to the baby who died the tiny waist of the first dress line ever wore a queer little tintype of daisy herself when she was a wee baby in it she had many fingers because she would wiggle them but the picture on which daisy's fingers immediately pounced was one of a mother bending over an old-fashioned cradle in which lay a sleeping baby while outside in the dooryard and in the distance away up the hillside many sheep and lambs were resting on the grass or frisking about in the sunshine what a lovely lovely picture daisy said how very pretty it would be for christmas if we could only get it framed and hung by christmas time wouldn't it be splendid we couldn't have it so nice as my beautiful peace and plenty picture of course but couldn't we make some kind of a frame don't you think there's the baby and the sheep and there's one shepherd it just fits while shepherds watched their flocks by night all seated on the ground you know only he didn't have such a cradle did he mother because you know it says for his cradle was a manger and his softest bed was hay don't you believe line we could fix it up subjects were very much mixed in our little daisy's mind but she knew exactly what she meant so did her listeners she was so eager and happy and resolute that it was impossible not to enter into the spirit of the matter with her 
and before the family went to bed on that thanksgiving night a wonderful frame had been planned and the place selected for the christmas picture to hang but though daisy bryant's heart was so set on furnishing a study she thought of other things beside books never a little girl of eight who loved her dolly better than daisy did her arabella aurelia much of her thinking was done with this treasure in her arms and between the pauses of her wisest remarks she frequently bent over and kissed her darling you would like me to stop just here and describe that doll baby was it china or wax or just common cloth that is one of the questions you know you want answered very well i will tell you it was neither cloth nor china nor yet wax but just plain wood a wooden dolly you never heard of such a thing how could its nose and eyes and ears be made were they carved or only painted alas i shall have to admit the sorrowful fact it had no eyes nor ears nor nose nor even mouth though i'm afraid it would have grieved its little mother to the heart to have had these defects talked about the truth was that arabella aurelia was once the arm of that large old-fashioned rocker which i told you had become mrs bryant's sewing chair she wore for every day a neat dark calico apron of mrs bryant's and on full dress occasions a ruffled white dress which had been daisy's own until time had worn it into shabbiness besides making it too short and too narrow for daisy but arabella aurelia was very thin so the worn places on the waist folded in out of sight and not having any arms of her own the fact that there were no sleeves left to the dress did not trouble her at all she really looked very nicely in it daisy loved her much as i said and kissed her often but it became evident in the course of time that she had many thoughts about her for instance one evening when the child lay flat on her lap and she was regarding it gravely she said mother if i had a really truly baby what do you suppose i'd name it what do you mean daisy a little sister or brother oh no i mean a doll baby but a really one why i don't know you would name it arabella aurelia after this one wouldn't you daisy shook her head emphatically oh no mother i never should i shouldn't like those names for a truly dolly why you know she began again after a thoughtful pause during which time she seemed to be trying to put into shape some ideas which puzzled her i don't know that i can explain it but of course this is not a really doll baby she hasn't any eyes nor mouth and i have to make believe about her all the time daisy sank her voice almost to a whisper apparently making believe that arabella aurelia could hear and not wishing to hurt her feelings but if i had a real doll with all those things which term covered the accidents of eyes mouth and other features why i wouldn't name her such a sort of make-believe name you know mother you wouldn't like to name your own daughter arabella aurelia now would you i don't believe i should said mrs bryant laughing although there did seem something pitiful in the fact that the wooden dolly beloved though she was had after all so little genuineness about her even to daisy's imagination well said daisy with a quickly smothered sigh that is just the way i feel if i had a truly dolly i should want her named mary or caroline or sarah or some name which belongs whereupon she caught up arabella aurelia and covered her wooden face with kisses wasn't that just too pitiful for anything line said after daisy was sound asleep for the night to hear that mouse go on about that old wooden arm mother i do wish we could get daisy a truly dolly for christmas mrs bryant sighed and sewed and shook her head we might make a body she said if we could get a pattern and we could make a suit of clothes for it at odd minutes but i'm afraid we can't manage the head this year line it is going to be close work you know 
yes line knew it and ben knew it he looked at the patches on his shoes and at the place where more patches were needed and shook his head and said nothing he needed new shoes but at that minute he felt willing to wear patched ones forever if he could only get a truly dolly for daisy the little girl hugged her wooden one close and kissed it more rapturously if possible than ever but put no more of her thoughts about it into words intended for the family yet what was in her heart found occasional vent in words murmured to arabella aurelia you are a dear good dolly if you are made of wood she sometimes said between tender kisses you never cry and you never pull my hair like some babies to be sure you can't because you have no arms nor mouth but then i don't believe you would if you could one morning she came from miss sutherland's with a package of soiled linen wrapped up in a half sheet of newspaper having disposed of the contents she retired with her newspaper to the study whither she always went to read no matter what hour of the day it was here she sat long reading at first then with hands folded in her lap eyes on the floor thinking mrs bryant who was hurrying about preparing to take her collars and cuffs from their foamy bath glanced at her occasionally and wondered what was being planned presently came the earnest little voice which very often had a wistful note in it that went to the mother's heart mother do you suppose somebody would want to name a dolly after me i should think almost anybody might be glad to mrs bryant said looking at the neat little figure in dark blue calico with a ruffle at her throat my whole name daisy isabel bryant why not well but it might not go well with her last name the dolly's mother's name you know and then again it might said mrs bryant smiling now in spite of her efforts to carry on her part of the conversation with becoming gravity what has put that idea into your mind why i was thinking that it was almost christmas time and there would be a great many new dollies and a great many names would have to be found for them and i was thinking what if some very nice little girl should have a lovely dolly and name her after me it would be almost like me having one the sentence ended with a patient little sigh it was some minutes before mrs bryant could make any answer then she said that is a very nice thought and as people generally make presents to their namesakes perhaps during the winter you could make some pretty little thing for her to wear for instance i have something which i think would make her a hat do you know any little girls who are going to have new dollies daisy's eyes had danced as she listened but over this question she grew grave yes um she said but i don't mean any of them i should like my namesake to live in a house where there was a piano and a room made of glass all for flowers and a study not like ours you know but a truly one well ours is truly what there is of it because we do have books she looked approvingly at the bible arithmetic and history and we study there but i mean a real large study with rows and rows of books and maps and history pictures and oh mother you know just what i mean don't you it seems as though i must have my namesake live in such a house as that but you don't know any little girls who live in such houses darling no ma'am i wasn't thinking of any little girls whom i know in this paper i brought home there are ever so many letters from girls and boys some of them younger than i am they write to the editor of the paper and ask questions and tell things i was wondering if i couldn't write to him and ask him to speak about it to the little girls who take his paper now daisy's writing was much crookeder than her thoughts generally were truth to tell she did not like to write very well the process was so much slower than thinking and the lines were so determined to be crooked that by the time the third one from the copy was written it looked like this readers note illustration of a copy book the first line is very straight and neat the next three lines in a juvenile hand 
progressively more and more crooked. End reader's note. As for Daisy, by the time the writing lesson was done, she looked utterly discouraged. Her mother had often wished that her little girl had some correspondent, that she might become interested in letter writing, but she had not expected any scheme like this. There were many difficulties in the way, and Daisy was particular as to the style of paper to be used, but she was, as usual, persevering. In the course of two or three days, there was written, signed, and sealed the following letter. Dear Mr. Editor, I am a girl eight years old. My hair is brown, so are my eyes. I have no dolly, only a wooden arm to the old rocking chair. It broke off and couldn't be mended, so we made a dolly of it. She is very nice. I love her dearly, but of course she has no mouth, nor eyes, nor anything of that kind. Her name is Arabella Aurelia. She had to be named kind of queerly, on account of being queer herself. But what I wanted to write to you about is to know if you would ask the little girls who take your paper, if they would not be so kind, only one of them, of course, as to name a new Christmas dolly after me. My name is Daisy Isabel Bryant. I think that would be a pretty name for a dolly, only perhaps rather long, unless the last name was quite short. I suppose the Isabel might be left out, and have only Daisy Bryant, only I like Isabel very much. I would have named Arabella Aurelia after me, but I couldn't quite like to, on account of her not having eyes nor arms. I don't expect to have a new dolly myself ever, because there are a great many things to get first, and by the time they are all got, I suppose I shall be too old for dolls. So I thought I would ask this favor of your little girls. If it can be done, just as well as not, I would like my namesake to live in a house which has a study, where they keep a great many books, because I like books myself, and we have a beginning of a study ourselves in the front part of Mother's kitchen, only it has but three books in it yet. Our books were burned in the fire, but I am very fond of them, and I mean to have rows and rows of them some day so I thought I'd like to have my namesake grow up among them. Mother thinks you probably won't print this letter, because, in the first place, we don't take your paper, and in the second place it is too long. I mean the letter is, you know. But I couldn't make it any shorter and tell you the things you need to know, could I? And we don't take any paper at all, since my father died. And so if you will just please tell the little girls about it, maybe some of them will and I thank you very much indeed. I am your true friend, Daisy Isabel Bryant. Over this letter there were many family councils, and, on the part of Line and Ben, more or less objections. But Mrs. Bryant was disposed to let her little girl have her own way in the matter. So at last the letter was addressed and stamped, and dropped in the post-box. That is the last you'll hear of that said skeptical ben oh i don't know said faithful daisy i can think about a dolly who is perhaps my namesake and when i'm a grown-up woman i may meet her i should love her all the same even if it didn't happen until i was twenty years old end of chapter two chapter three of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Aren't Things Queer? The study in which Judge Dunmore sat reading would certainly have satisfied Daisy Bryant's book-loving heart. Rows and rows and rows of books. In open bookcases and in closed bookcases, reaching to the ceiling and reaching to the floor. Then there was an elegant study table, and a white old-fashioned lounge with cushiony arms where little d dunmore often curled herself for an afternoon nap oh it was a delightful room on the evening of which i write the family were gathered in it and work was going on which would have relieved daisy's mind mrs dunmore had her sewing and miss edith was crocheting a new style of fascinator 
certainly if sewing and crocheting could venture into this study daisy need worry no more about her mother's work basket at a side table under a drop light the only student the room now contained a young fellow of perhaps fourteen or fifteen bent over his latin grammar little miss d sat almost in the centre of the room caressing a new dolly it still lacked nearly a week of christmas but the dolly had arrived by express from an auntie in paris and of course could not be left packed all that time judge dunmore was reading the evening paper presently he looked up and sent his eyes in search of d is that dolly named yet daughter no sir we can't decide on a name edith wants her to be named d after me but i don't quite want two d dunmores in the same family edith wants it because she likes litter a pause and a slightly added flush on her cheeks over the unusual word then the little woman went boldly on litter shun a shout of laughter followed but mrs dunmore made haste to say alliteration dear you had it right all but the beginning and a little letter in the middle well here is a chance for you litter shun and all my son will you excuse the interruption while i read aloud a short letter whereupon he read daisy bryant's letter to the editor quite through something was the matter with his glasses by the time he had finished he took them off and gave them a vigorous rubbing poor little thing said mrs dunmore and her voice trembled it is a lovely name edith said daisy isabel bryant d that's the very name for your dolly daisy isabel bryant dunmore nothing could be more elegant if i were you i would write to her at once and tell her all about the dolly and describe the study the number of books would suit her i think i shouldn't wonder if she would make a good little correspondent judge dunmore said the editor has given us a facsimile of her letter the writing is rather crooked but the spelling is perfectly correct and the ideas are certainly well expressed it is very pathetic i think said mrs dunmore amid all this talk d sat with her arms clasped tightly around her dolly her eyes meantime looking into space d was doing some very grave thinking on her own account suddenly she burst forth that child ought to have a new dolly of her own the idea of her having nothing but an old wooden arm of a chair to love and kiss and put to bed oh dear me papa couldn't we send her a dolly for christmas i really don't know daughter could we how much are you willing to give toward it this was bringing philanthropy down to a fine point miss d had her own small purse and was required to supply herself with certain cheap necessaries such as lead pencils pens pins and the like and was rigidly held to cash accounts and monthly settlements she looked very sober over her father's question her mother tried to relieve her anxiety a neat little dolly such as the child would consider a treasure would cost but a trifle a dollar ought to buy one a quick resolute shake of her head came from d oh no mamma if you please i shouldn't like that at all my dolly is so lovely i wouldn't want to have such a great difference between them a little girl who could plan about a study and all those things would know what a truly nice dolly was don't you think so oh i haven't a doubt of it but could you afford an expensive dolly just now dear d looked troubled again why i could help she said it is so near to christmas time that i am rather poor but i think wouldn't you help buy it dear mamma it is benevolence you know how can you prove that d it was the judge who spoke now a dolly is a sort of luxury you see and to give luxuries to the poor is not benevolence is it oh no indeed papa a dolly is not a luxury it is a necessity that is in houses where there are no real babies 
of course i would rather have a little brother or sister a hundred times but i haven't you know and this daisy hasn't of course or she would say so and papa a little girl couldn't go to sleep without a dolly she couldn't really and besides mamma says my dolly helps me to learn to sew and to care for clothing and plan what is needed in different seasons it helps you in a good many ways doesn't it mamma judge dunmore laughed very well argued he said you have won your case as soon as i learn what your desires are and how much you propose to give towards it yourself i will add my contribution well papa you know i said i was poor and i cannot do much but there is a lovely dolly in mrs streeter's store and she is good mrs streeter is i think she will let us have it for what it cost her she told me it cost her five dollars that would be just the same as her giving something towards it you know i have only twenty-five cents though of my own to give and that's dreadful little do you think we could raise five dollars papa try it said judge dunmore let us see how good an operator you are i will give one dollar towards it oh papa that's a nice beginning mamma how much will you help aren't papa and i one mrs dunmore asked smiling d was ready with her answer if you are mamma you ought to do exactly what papa does i should think there was a sound of clapping of hands from the judge's corner and amid much laughing mrs dunmore declared this logic was overpowering and she might be counted on for a dollar then edith and the young student were assailed and after some bantering agreed to fifty cents each it is getting on beautifully d said her doll laid flat on the floor while her mistress counted her chubby fingers to make sure of the result i know we shall get it all but i'm sorry my part is so small i wanted to ask her to name her dolly for me but i don't like to give only twenty-five cents i could put you in the way of making it a dollar if you chose said mrs dunmore quietly oh mamma how wouldn't that be just lovely the difference between the buttons you chose for your suit and the ones i said would answer is just seventy-five cents d looked grave and business-like but that wouldn't be my money mamma oh you may do what you please with the seventy-five cents i gave you permission to select the buttons and you have done so if you choose now to take cheaper ones the money thus saved becomes yours d clasped and unclasped her hands thoughtfully mamma those buttons were very ugly they didn't shine a bit they were not so pretty as the more expensive ones of course but they are neat and appropriate silence and perplexity on the part of one then a long-drawn sigh as she stooped to pick up her dolly i hate dull buttons and i don't believe i ever quite like things that are only appropriate if i hadn't bought that blue satin cushion and that queer-shaped little box which broke as soon as i got home i needn't do it but i'm going to you can order the doll buttons mamma and give me the seventy-five cents but won't i be the only one who has made a sacrifice no indeed declared miss edith it was a very great sacrifice for me to give fifty cents i had at least fifty ways of spending it and as for max he is always poor aren't you max i am said the student but i am a great admirer of daisy isabel bryant besides said the mother you ought to be the one to sacrifice if it is to be done this is your scheme you know but what about the other dollar i can get it easily enough said d nodding her head in an assured way there's grandma i don't feel the least bit in the world afraid but that she'll give it now if mrs strader will do her part we are all right i'm going to name my dolly after her i'll write and tell her so and i mean to ask her to write letters to me may i papa i don't know daughter mrs strader seems to me a strange name to call a doll 
and i should think you would prefer conversing with her rather than correspondence oh why papa papa don't you know i mean the little girl you didn't say so my dear now i have a little plan if yours is arranged to your mind it is easy to read between the lines in that little girl's letter though she didn't intend it there are other than doll's wardrobes needed there i imagine what if we should put the dolly in mrs strader's window dressed ready for travelling hang a purse on her arm and pin the little girl's letter to her dress to tell its story wouldn't that be suggestive enough mamma mrs dunmore agreed that it would certainly be very suggestive and expressed her willingness to put some money in the purse as for d she went into a perfect ecstasy of delight half smothering her papa with kisses as a reward for his beautiful thought being an energetic little woman she lost no time and by eleven o'clock of the following morning both grandma and mrs strader having been found gracious the extra dollar was secured the dolly bought and stood in a conspicuous centre of mrs strader's show window that she was a lovely dolly dressed in the perfection of modern style no one could gainsay her elegant hat was a contribution from miss edith dunmore who stayed from the morning concert at corning hall to get it ready for my lady's first appearance truth compels me to tell that she found the feather in a box of castaway finery which had been made ready for the rag man but when it was steamed and curled with a dull-edged knife it really looked elegant moreover miss edith getting deeper and deeper into the spirit of the thing summoned her young friends with their castaway boxes that very afternoon and out of bits of ribbon and velvet and lace and silk and skill manufactured such a toilet as any fashionable young lady the size of this one might admire meantime in the show window miss d dunmore bryant did her pretty work when judge dunmore called he selected a strong and pretty purse and had it fastened to the ribbons of her jacket and a streamer of white ribbon was attached to her hat on which was printed stop and read my story in her hand was placed daisy bryant's printed letter with a few added lines of explanation which the judge himself had written it was pretty to see how interested the people were in that show window it seemed as though almost everybody who came that way paused smiling at the lovely face and curious streamer read smiled again stepped inside and gently took from her pretty kid hand the story read it asked questions of mrs strader then still smiling though some of them had almost tears in their eyes dropped their offering into the purse and went their way no i am wrong some of them lingered for more than that they found mrs strader polite and attentive they found she had many useful and pretty things for sale and sold them at reasonable prices some of them discovered that she was a widow that she was bravely trying to support herself and three children by means of this neat and well-kept store that she belonged to the same church with themselves and that though they had never thought of it before she certainly ought to have some of their patronage that was a good thought of yours my dear said mrs strader to d when on the evening of that first eventful day she called to see how her namesake was prospering i hope you will have more like it come into your pretty head i don't know how much money has been dropped into the purse but i know i have had to empty it three times into that strong locked box on the shelf there to make room for more and i know i never sold so many things in one day before people come in to see miss dolly and see something that they like and buy it people who have never been inside my store before miss d and more than that some of them promise to be good customers of mine after this i can well afford to let you have the dolly for just what i paid for it and i'll add some things to the box she travels in see if i don't i laid awake nights bemoaning my folly in buying so expensive a dolly for my modest little store and told myself a dozen times a night 
that i would never get my money back and here it is the most useful person who ever looked out of my store window i'll not forget the little lady nor the one who named her it is papa's thought mrs strader said truthful d i thought about buying the dolly but i never could have planned anything so nice as sending a present with her papa did every bit of that he is a lawyer you know and lawyers always think of things to her mother d said aren't things queer mamma you can't do the least little bit of good to anybody without doing good to a lot of other people there's our dolly and mrs strader she says this is going to make her a happy new year because it will make her square with the old year she means she will not be in debt mamma i didn't understand about being square so i asked her and grandma says giving that dollar for the dolly made her think about those things she has had laid away so long to give to somebody and she sent a bundle to old mrs barnes this very day and papa says when he looked at her little pink and white face the dollies i mean it made him think of that little bit of a girl who lives over the wagon shop and he sent her father a cartful of things for christmas because he is sick you know and can't earn them aren't things real mixed up and queer no man liveth to himself quoted the judge who was in the library and overheard the talk that was what the little one means though she doesn't know how to express it end of chapter three chapter four of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four d dunmore bryant in mrs bryant's kitchen everything was in beautiful order though it was still quite early the household had been astir since long before daylight daisy finding it impossible to sleep and her mother silently determining that a quart of oil should be sacrificed if necessary so that her little daughter might have the full benefit of the christmas day it was a household in which kerosene oil as well as everything else was used most economically but christmas came but once a year and daisy would never be just eight years old again so the lamp was lighted before six o'clock the excitement of examining the stocking that hung all alone by the chimney corner was well over and an intense excitement it had been almost everything in it had been a surprise to the little girl some of the things would not go into the stocking at all but hung in delightfully bulgy and mysterious packages outside with a cord attached to them and pinned to the red stocking for instance ben had with a little help from the friendly carpenter around the corner made for her the most complete little set of bookshelves that daisy had ever seen she felt certain there were none nicer in the world and she may be sure that none were ever made with more painstaking care three shelves beautifully smooth and stained to look like the solid black walnut of miss sutherland's bookcases they were already hung the three books placed upon them and continually daisy's eyes roved to that choice corner and her heart gave strong little beats of happiness over the bookcase as daisy assured them the shelves must be called were hanging the christmas pictures in their gay frames on the upper shelf were arranged with great care certain smaller treasures from the stocking a pretty heart-shaped pincushion from mother stuck full of pins of different sizes a neat little box covered with gay pictures and lined with pink cloth to make it strong enough for the three spools and the speck of a needle book with five needles placed in shining rows on the bit of fine notched flannel inside there had been intense excitement over that box for in addition to the spools and the needle book gifts from mother there had gleamed before daisy's astonished eyes a real truly silver thimble of just the right size for her small finger miss sutherland had called one morning with some collars and cuffs that she was in haste to have laundried and had found mrs bryant busy lining the box taking advantage of daisy's having been sent down town on errands miss sutherland had admired the pink lining and the bright pictures 
and had asked several questions and the night before christmas had come this bit of a thimble together with a box of choice grapes for line and a basket of apples for ben but the crowning delight of daisy's heart had been the united gift of mother line and ben this was nothing less wonderful than a bright patchwork curtain some of the patches of silk and some of bright soft wools and being hung on a strong red cord that ben had bought with the last cent he had in the world it was long enough and wide enough to curtain off the study so that on occasion it could be entirely separated from the kitchen could anything ever be nicer than that it was hard for daisy to believe that she could ever be happier or more grateful than she was this morning truth to tell i don't suppose she ever will be with all these wonders to admire and talk over for to each belonged half a dozen separate stories it had been hard work to eat any breakfast though they had bread cakes and syrup as well as baked potatoes we'll be downright extravagant for once said line and have cakes and baked potatoes and applesauce and we are going to have a chicken again for dinner larger than the one we had on thanksgiving day i do believe i tell you what daisy bryant it isn't every little girl who has such a time made over her being eight years old daisy fully believed this and was happy now at ten o'clock with the kitchen in perfect order with the delicious smell of roasting chicken already in the air with the curtain drawn before the lovely little study daisy sat in her own low chair her wooden dolly on her lap and looked about her with satisfied smiles on her face are you perfectly contented her mother asked smiling on her as she stopped on her way to the oven door to peep into the study and see what was going on yes am or well no ma'am not quite said daisy with a little shamefaced laugh i did think that maybe there would be some little girl write me a christmas letter to tell me that she had named her dolly for me but ben went to the office you know when he took the apple basket home and there wasn't anything perhaps it will come to-morrow said her mother soothingly or to-night but i wouldn't expect it too much if i were you this is a very busy world and little girls don't write many letters i think it more than likely that the little girl who named her new dolly for you meant to write you and tell you about it but she will keep putting it off until by and by she will think it is too late then you think there is a dolly named for me said daisy with a bright face oh i haven't a doubt of it said mrs bryant as she went in some haste toward the stove for the applesauce was sputtering as though it meant to boil over in less than another minute it was just then that daisy heard an emphatic knock at the back door she sat still and listened for her mother's quick step moved toward the door then she heard the following remarkable conversation good morning ma'am have you a party stopping with you by the name of d dunmore bryant d dunmore bryant repeated mrs bryant wonderingly no i don't know that name at all there is no one stopping here but my own family well this trunk is sent to your care or to little miss daisy's the card reads plainly enough in fact it's print miss d dunmore bryant care of miss daisy isabel bryant i kind of thought i'd like to see miss d dunmore if she was here for judging from this trunk i thought she must be about the size of my thumb with a broad smile on his face the village express man stepped forward and landed in the middle of the little kitchen a trunk about two feet long one foot wide and perhaps a little more than a foot high a perfect trunk studded with brass nails and locked and strapped in the most businesslike manner came by express ma'am said the man his face seeming to grow broader while he looked first at mrs bryant then at the trunk i only hope miss d dunmore isn't done up inside of it for it is a well-made little thing and there wouldn't be much chance for air inside by this time daisy was in the kitchen her eyes very large there was certainly her name in neat print on the end of the dear little trunk 
but who in the world was miss d dunmore bryant and how should they find her and let her know that they had her trunk this was the question which troubled the bryant household for some time the express man who was a friend of ben's and who liked to do a good turn for his friends went away laughing declaring that there was nothing to pay or at least if there was he would wait until miss d dunmore bryant put in an appearance before he presented his bill for if she could get all her furbelows into a trunk of that size he would be mighty well to see her i would open the thing declared ben when he had come home and walked around it and lifted it on his shoulder to try its weight and wondered and studied as much as the others it is sent to daisy's care and it's our own name and she doesn't know how to take care of it without knowing what is inside hello look here tucked under this strap is the mite of a key tied on with a cord they mean you shall open it and take care of the things they may be flowers or something that will spoil wouldn't you open it mother i believe i would said mrs bryant who began to have a theory of her own to the effect that miss d dunmore might really be inside but she kept her own counsel and looked on while ben with nervous haste unstrapped the wee trunk and daisy her fingers trembling so that she could hardly do it turned the key and threw up the lid a complete trunk inside as well as out fitted up in compartments hat box shoe box toilet box everything complete all carefully closed and fastened down on the very top however was a letter addressed in a round hand to miss daisy isabel bryant hurrah said ben here is a letter for you daisalinda now we will understand this mystery shut down the lid of the trunk said her thoughtful and far-seeing mother and let daisy read the letter before we go any farther then if it is her duty to unpack the trunk she can have the pleasure of doing it herself so daisy broke the seal and read aloud my dear friend daisy isabel bryant mother who can it be from i have no friend to write to me i don't know dear perhaps it is some one who has written an answer to the letter you sent to the paper read on said line then you will find out who it is yes hurry up said ben we can't stand such suspense as this very long and as he spoke his eyes danced with pleasure he had caught a gleam of his mother's thought what a thing it would be if somebody had really sent daisy a dolly and daisy read i am d dunmore exclamations of astonishment and pleasure from the listeners a little girl pretty near nine years old at least i was eight almost three months ago papa read your letter in the paper aloud to us and as i had a new dolly come from paris only a few weeks ago and she hadn't any name i named her for you right away she is lovely i have sent you her picture so that you can see for yourself i sent mine too because i had none of dolly without me and besides i thought maybe you might like to see me too i am going to be your friend you know and to write letters to you if you will answer them i don't write very well yet but i am learning then i thought it was kind of lonesome to have only a dolly who had no mouth nor eyes nor any of those things i don't mean that she isn't nice and i know you love her because sometimes mamma rolls up a pillow for me for a dolly and i find i love it very much but then i couldn't get along with only that kind of a dolly and i thought i ought to have a namesake too so we made up our minds to send you one named after me and she is in the trunk and we hope you will like her oh mother said daisy stopping for breath and almost ready to cry in her surprise and delight oh mother do you think there is a real truly dolly for me in this trunk i begin to think so said mrs bryant and she turned away just then to look at the chicken in the oven and wiped her eyes with the corner of her apron go ahead said ben and daisy read mamma helped and papa and grandma and all of them mrs strader did too so it is a present from all of us sister edith and her friend made the clothes and i really think the hat is lovely 
the plume is a piece of one that my auntie sent from paris the purse on her arm is not d s but yours papa sent it with his love and he says the things in it are from your friends who feel sure that you will make good use of them he says ever so many friends helped send them to you that it is a trifle from each in memory of the christmas time and the dear saviour who said it was more blessed to give than to receive and you are to give our regards to your mother and tell her we hope she will let you accept these gifts for his sake those are papa's very words i had a great time writing them i had to keep asking him over and over what came next it took me almost all day to write this letter and i had to copy it twice once i blotted dreadfully and once i got it all mixed up it doesn't take me so long when i write just my own words because i pick out the little bits of ones i like to speak long words pretty well but it is a good deal of trouble to write them they have so many letters you see well i hope you will love d dunmore and i am sure you will i hope you will like the name i like daisy isabella very much indeed i never had a dolly in my life whose name i liked so well oh i forgot to tell you that the dress in the bottom of the trunk is too large for d and too small for me and mamma thought it possible it might fit you she says if it doesn't your mamma will know some little girl to give it to now i wish you merry christmas and i hope you will write to me good-bye d dunmore well of all things in this world said ben the minute the letter was finished though what all things in this world had to do with it he did not explain as for daisy she sat like one stunned staring at the letter in her lap why don't you open the trunk dear and give d a breath of fresh air mother said daisy doesn't it seem almost too wonderful some way then she dived forward and raised the lid and amid little squeals of delight and exclamations of rapture miss d was drawn out from her wrappings and stood before them smiling lips blue eyes curly hair and all could i describe her do you think or her wardrobe for that matter it was without doubt the most elegant one that was ever unpacked in that little village do look at the silk dresses said line miss sutherland's wardrobe sinks into insignificance beside this one the purse had slipped from her delicate hand and lay just at her side and was heavy ben took it in hand and his face grew first red then pale as he said at last almost under his breath mother there are fifty dollars in that purse what does it all mean but daisy had forgotten the purse and its contents she was rapturously kissing the picture of a sweet-faced little girl with a dolly in her arms End of chapter four chapter five of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five d dunmore's rivals what does it all mean asked ben at last his usually cheery face clouded over i don't understand it mother we may be poor but we are surely not objects of charity this isn't charity my boy said mrs bryant with her brightest smile this is grace then seeing that ben's face did not brighten she added speaking very kindly but with a good deal of decision ben dear don't allow yourself to be above receiving kindly and cordial lifts in this world from your brothers and sisters these are not strangers they belong to our father's family we did not appeal to them for a christmas gift but our father knows perfectly well that we are in closer quarters than usual this winter and while i had not reached the point of asking any one but him i am more than thankful that he has put it into the hearts of some of our brothers and sisters to give us a lift towards the rent and the new stove which seems almost a necessity it seems just like beggars said ben and his voice was almost scornful why none of us begged my boy 
though i hope our pride would not be above even that if it should be plainly shown that it was our duty look here mother's boy the feeling you are nursing now is beneath you it looks just enough like real honest virtue for satan to succeed in deceiving you and i have no doubt he is very much tickled this minute about having done so to go about asking for help or even to be willing to receive help that is unnecessary is to have a mean nature but on the other hand to be above refusing a heartily offered and kindly meant lift when one is really in need shows a mean nature also you will never be mean in one direction ben and if i were you i would see to it that satan didn't outwit me at the other end of the line well but mother here interposed line it is so queer and strange to have such a thing happen to us whoever heard of a lot of strangers starting up and sending money to people whom they didn't know at all and who didn't ask for any of their help it is strange mused mrs bryant when you talk about a lot of strangers but when one thinks of father and the other children of the family it isn't so strange after all it is just like him line laughed a little and yet her laugh had almost a note of awe in it her mother's way of speaking about god was always wonderful and rather bewildering both to ben and line ben's face was clearing he did not fully understand his mother but he had great faith in her and sense enough to see that her dignity was superior to his he did not want to be mean certainly it was a new idea to him that it was possible for a person to be too small of nature to receive gifts graciously as for daisy she was still so absorbed in loving miss d dunmore that she took no part in this conversation and indeed did not give it her usual attention one sentence however had attracted her and she gave over kissing d dunmore and looked thoughtfully at her mother for a full minute before she asked her grave question mother are we in need yes said ben that's the question mrs bryant was still for so long that line looked at her in surprise then gave ben a half reproachful glance as much as to say see how you've made her feel with your questionings children said mrs bryant and her voice trembled a little despite her effort to control it mother doesn't tell you all her cares because you are too young yet to bear their weight but now that the blessed father in heaven has come to us in so wonderful a way perhaps you ought to know that there are a few debts in spite of all i could do pressing upon us one in particular that i could see no way of meeting it has troubled me night and day for weeks though i have not let any of you know about it because i knew you were doing all you could now and it seemed hard to give you any more burdens to think about a few nights ago i was able to leave it in the hands of our father and to say to him that i was willing to trust to his way of leading me though it should be quite in the dark and it did seem dark i can tell you i puzzled my head all one night trying to think of ways in which help might come but i never thought of this one mother said ben his voice grave and respectful i did not understand i mean i did not know you had a trouble before mrs bryant could open her lips to reply to this something else astonishing happened another knock at the door and another box on the steps two of them indeed both directed very plainly to daisy isabel bryant what in the world said ben and then fell to work with hammer and axe to find out daisy pale with excitement laid d dunmore down very carefully and came herself to lift the soft cotton from whatever precious thing lay underneath it another dolly the loveliest little old-fashioned darling dressed in a round waist of rich embroidery with a full baby skirt and a broad embroidered collar and cuffs with real hair on her head and real shoes on her feet and a card in her pretty hand which read i am nelly may and i wish you a merry christmas and a happy new year 
i've come to live with you mother said daisy her lips fairly trembling oh mother but that was just as much as the lips were capable of doing hold on said ben there's more things in this box a whole raft of dresses and things i suppose no as true as my name is benjamin foster bryant there's another doll sure enough a lovely little woman in a long new market buttoned to her toes and a charming little storm hood out of which the sweetest face peeped as daisy bent forward to make out the name from alice castleton to daisy isabel bryant with happy new year wishes there were many other things in that box a whole raft of dresses and things as ben had said also a cunning little bedstead all made up ready for nelly may to sleep on and a set of china dishes for her refreshments so eager were they all in their admiring examination of the pretty things that they almost forgot there was another box ben being a boy was ready for it first but declared that he could tell before opening what was in it there was another doll of course oh no daisy said but her cheeks were very red again and she came over to get the first peep when the cover was lifted the fair baby who met her gaze asleep on her little bed with one chubby arm thrown back of her head and one foot doubled under her looked so much like life that for a minute all four after the first breathless examination from daisy stood and looked saying nothing at last ben was equal to his favorite and most expressive remark well i never then they fell to unpacking the baby was found to open its eyes as soon as it was stood on its feet it also had brought its bed along and a supply of lovely white slips mrs bryant called them and was little emmeline from new york so a card under the pillow declared to undertake to describe the bryant family for the remainder of that day would be a task quite beyond my powers line declared she was but six years old she was sure and wanted to do nothing but dress and undress dollies and mrs bryant said she did not wonder it was enough to make even her into a child again to see such an array of lovely dollies but if they said this at eleven o'clock what do you think they said by seven that evening when the afternoon express came in no less than five boxes were brought to the little brown house each of them addressed to miss daisy isabel bryant and each containing a dolly with the five o'clock train there came seven more boxes and by six the little study was literally overflowing with children sitting on the new shelves standing in rows against the walls or lying on their own little beds one of the cunningest was named the little girl who will not be dressed sure enough a little barefooted darling with her hair in her eyes and her hands spread out and for clothing only a short striped skirt with straps over her shoulders when line stood her against the wall she declared that she looked for all the world like the rogue who was visiting at dr priestley's and who always ran away the nurse said before he was dressed in the morning but excitement though very great did not really reach white heat until a box larger than the others was opened and found to contain a very remarkable family five in number two great rag dolls with woolly heads and thick red lips and white eyes dressed in the brightest colors imaginable and three sweet-faced charmingly dressed dollies exhibiting every variety of costume the card which accompanied them read the misses cecilia rosamond and gabrielle rushington and their two maids topsy and terzy who have all come to live with daisy isabel bryant and bring with them the love and good wishes of the four little cushman girls who live in atlanta what a pity i could not show you pictures of all those dollies what a pity i could not photograph that study for you when they were all arranged for the night thirty-five dolls in dignified rows around that astonished little room daisy had arranged and rearranged with the help of her mother and line 
even ben lent a hand when the family grew too numerous for management without him talk about the old woman who lived in her shoe he said to daisy poising one of the late comers named greta from over the seas on the palm of his hand as he made careful scrutiny of the shoes she wore why she was nothing compared to you what in the world will be done with them all i'll have to build you an orphan asylum no said daisy stopping short in the midst of her anxious putting of the baby to bed arranging her little arms in the same sweet way they were when she arrived don't say that ben they are not orphans i am their mother whereupon ben burst into the loudest laugh the little house had heard that day if she isn't ready to mother every one of them he said why daisy do you mean to say you are going to adopt even this little dutch party she hasn't been over from germany a month if she has a week she is dutch from her plastered down hair to her queer-looking feet daisy laid the baby down hastily and came over to ben in her eyes a reproachful look give her to me she said with dignity i don't like her made fun of i don't really seems as if she could understand i like her if she is dutch she cannot help not being as pretty as the others but i shall love her all the same with a good deal of effort ben checked the laugh that wanted to peal forth again it was too queer but daisy was in as evident earnest as she had ever been in her life she had opened her heart and taken in the whole company dutch girl colored maids and all she is the queerest little mixture of baby and grown-up woman i ever saw in my life he said when daisy was at last tucked away for the night so worn out from the unusual excitement that her mother could not help feeling a little anxious about her sometimes she has such wise thoughts that it seems as though she must be a great deal older than she is and sometimes she is just a baby herself you ought to go and look at her now ben said line she is sound asleep with d dunmore in her arms and nelly may's bedstead close beside her crib and the dutch girl you laughed at lies with her square head on the other pillow she said she would have to hold d in her arms because she began to love her first and could not help wanting her real close but she was never going to let that dutch dolly suppose that because she was so fleshy and her clothes were not so pretty as the others she did not think a great deal of her daisy is too funny for anything you don't either of you know where arabella aurelia is said mrs bryant come with me and i'll show you so they all tiptoed in to see mrs bryant turned down the sheet with careful hand and there was arabella aurelia the beloved armchair dolly lying flat upon her mother's bosom closer even than d dunmore with all her beauty she asked me said mrs bryant when they had tiptoed back again whether if i had had a prettier little girl than she come to live with me i would give her her place i'd like to see you find a prettier girl said ben with energy then after a moment mother what in the world will she do with all those dolls i'm sure i don't know his mother said then the bryant family looked at one another and laughed End of chapter five chapter six of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter six if i only had around the corner but a short walk from mrs bryant's little cottage lived a family whose young people were quite intimate friends of ben and line bryant not that they were in the least like them unless the likeness could be found in the fact that both mothers were widows and were working hard to take care of their children to mrs bryant it seemed as if mrs kedwin's life was much harder than hers it is true mrs kedwin had three sons while she had only one but then mrs kedwin's oldest son was gone to sea they had not even heard from him in more than a year 
and the second boy was wild and hard was not her own ben worth a dozen such boys as that mrs kedwin lived in a larger house than she much larger in fact and some of her rooms were quite fine but that was because she kept boarders for a living and worked hard day and night almost to keep the rooms looking as nice as she could in order to satisfy her boarders a cheap boarding-house the people further up town called it though the boarders themselves never thought the price they paid was small and grumbled a great deal about everything poor mrs kedwin often came for a few minutes to pour her troubles into mrs bryant's sympathetic ears and to say she was running behind all the time she was sure she did not know what was to become of them on the whole mrs bryant who did not see how her own family was to get through the winter yet knew that she would not for a good deal have changed places with mrs kedwin as for the young people who were about the same age as ben and line it must be admitted that those two sometimes envied them for they were still in school studying the same lessons that the bryant young people longed to master yet line confessed herself as vexed about half the time with fanny kedwin she ought to have been named if i only had she said one day to ben she is forever telling what she would do if she only had this or that and she lets slip chances that might amount to something just because she hasn't something else that would be nice to put with them i've no patience with her well said ben rufus is just so he hangs around saturday mornings and tells what splendid paths he could make and how much money he could earn if he only had one of those snow ploughs while i go to work with my old worn-out snow shovel and earn a few shillings every little helps but rufus doesn't seem to think so if he can't do a big thing he doesn't want to do anything one evening not long after the arrival of the dolls rufus and fanny kedwin came to spend an hour or two with their friends mrs bryant had gone out for the evening on an errand which often took her from home on duane street lived a young couple with their baby in a lovely home all by themselves they had discovered that if they could get mrs bryant to bring her sewing and come and sit in their pretty little parlor with the door ajar into the bedroom they could go to a lecture or concert together leaving their darling in her care and feel perfectly safe and comfortable about her so many an honest penny did mrs bryant earn in this pleasant way line and ben were always glad to have her go for they said it was a great deal easier way to earn money than to iron all the evening or sit and sew besides said line she can sit and sew at the same time be paid for staying there as well as getting paid for the sewing two earnings put into one little daisy was never able to reason about it in this philosophical manner she made no complaints but it was so nice and comfortable to have mother at home in the evening and it was so lonesome to have her gone that daisy as she sat in her own little chair with d dunmore bryant on her lap and arabella aurelia at her feet looked sober and made very few remarks in fact she paid but little attention at first to what was being said until fanny who had silently watched line's fingers flying for a few minutes for line was hemming ruffles with which to trim the skirts her mother was making for mrs potter made this remark if we only had a machine i might earn some money this winter miss webster was asking mother today if she knew of any one who could make some plain underclothes for her mother said she didn't unless it was your mother but she said she heard your mother say she had on hand all she could do now if we had a machine i could do them as well as not but there's no use in talking i might as well wish for a piano and be done with it as to wish for a sewing machine i never expect to have either oh yes you will said ben rufus will buy you both one of these days see if he doesn't line was not giving very close attention to this 
her thoughts were on the sewing does she want her work done on a machine she asked presently why no i don't suppose she would care about that but then who would do it without a machine great long seams and lots of hemming it would just be drudgery i wouldn't do it for anything i don't know said line it would be slow work of course but then if one had nothing else to do i'm about run out of knitting i used up all my yarn it is getting so late in the season mother thinks i could hardly get my money back if i bought more i wouldn't mind sewing by hand if i could find anybody willing to wait until i got it done there is very little on mother's sewing she will let me do she does such fine work most of the time who is miss webster said ben why doesn't she do her own sewing why she can't said fanny she is sick you know she hurt her back when she was a girl and she can't sew not even enough to mend her clothes without making it ache she does not work at all oh is she that one who rides around in a sort of hand carriage asked ben i've seen her i met her this morning out riding with her dog she's got the cunningest dog out said rufus he knows everything you say to him minds as well as a boy does he and willie are great friends said fanny he lets willie maul him dreadfully and doesn't growl or look cross this morning mother scolded willie real hard he would keep jumping on eben and it hurt him he squealed out as if in pain and at last mother gave willie a box on his ear and set him up on a chair where she told him to stay till he could behave himself she spoke real cross you know and eben knew his playmate was being scolded what did he do but get up slowly from the corner where he had gone to get away from willie walk across the room and hold out his paw to willie to shake hands we all shouted right out it was so cute in the old fellow and mother let willie get down from his chair as soon as he said he was sorry she said it would never do to have a dog more ready to forgive than she was herself then rufus had a story to tell that is a great dog he said i'd give a good deal if he was mine miss webster tells us lots of funny stories about him at home he is left to guard the stables a great deal of the time they feel perfectly safe to leave fine harnesses and whips and everything out there and the doors unlocked because eben will not allow anything to be touched unless it is some one he has been told has a right when they got a new man he had to be taken out and introduced to eben before he could go to work introduced said ben how do they manage that why just as they would introduce anybody and tell eben he's come to stay and must be allowed to handle the robes and whips and things ben was not much acquainted with dogs and laughed a good deal over this idea i guess he wouldn't find much fault if a fellow should go to work who hadn't been introduced he said oh but he would declared rufus miss webster told us of a friend of hers with whom eben was well acquainted he used to pet eben and play with him and eben liked him very much but the man had never been in the stables till one day he stopped there to speak to miss webster's brother who was upstairs looking for something they wanted nobody was there only him and the dog and he thought he would see how far the dog would let him go so he took hold of the whip and started for the door in an instant eben was at his side growling low but in a way that meant business miss webster said that man couldn't stir a step until he put down the whip she said they used to tease the gentleman a great deal after that they told him they felt perfectly safe since eben evidently understood his character whereupon daisy spoke for the first time in some minutes mr jones ought to have that dog for a clerk why asked both girls at once while the boys turned and looked curiously at her because the clerk he has now lets the girls and boys take nuts out of the barrels when mr jones is not there why ye said line that is stealing pshaw said rufus his face growing red 
what's a nut or two or an apple they didn't take a whole handful i should say that a nut or two in a case like that was a nut or two that belonged to mr jones and unless i had paid my money for them i would much rather they would be in his hands than mine said ben i should think so said daisy gravely but rufus only laughed though the flush stayed on his face i'd like to get miss webster's sewing said line i'd like to get miss webster's dog said ben imitating line's voice then they all laughed i can't arrange about the dog said fanny good-naturedly but i should think we could about the sewing she really wants some done very much i should think she has spoken to mother about it two or three times i might tell her you could do it and that your mother could help you if you came to places you didn't know how to do yourself that is if you really want it but i never would it is such dreadful slow work it will take you ages to earn a dollar it will not take me so long as it will do to do nothing said line smiling i'll tell you what said fanny come over to-morrow and see her for yourself she's real pleasant not a bit stuck up as some rich ladies are is she rich asked ben i guess she is you ought to see her elegant things silk wrappers and embroidered skirts she doesn't think any more about wearing them than i do about wearing calico i shouldn't think she would care whether she had pretty things or not though lame all the while as she is still it must be nice to have lots of money she has been here for three winters she always boarded at the carroll house before where they pay twenty dollars a week for board think of that line bryant twenty dollars for what one person eats and sleeps in a week she came down to this street because she wanted to be near the little gray church on the corner the minister there is a friend of hers and she says on pleasant sundays she can leave her window open and hear them sing and imagine she hears them pray that is the way she goes to prayer meeting she told mother once that the hardest thing for her to give up was prayer meeting doesn't that seem queer i can't imagine how a person can care so much for prayer meeting it sounds awful wicked to say it but i always think they are the dullest places in the world if i had to go every week i don't know what would become of me i don't enjoy them very well said line but i know people who do mother does and she is always sorry when somebody must have ironing done on that evening she always goes when she can you don't go do you not very often said line this time of year i stay with daisy because she is too young to be kept up it is such a long walk from here you know ben goes to take care of mother i don't believe ben likes it do you ben do i what asked ben who had been giving close attention to something rufus was describing and had not heard what fanny said do you like to go to prayer meeting line said you went to take care of your mother and i said i didn't believe you liked it do you not remarkably said ben his face grave his eyes fixed on the bit of board he was whittling no more do i said rufus promptly i never go unless i can't help myself one night when mrs knox was boarding at our house there was no one to go with her and i had to and i thought it was the dullest place out mother doesn't think so said daisy in a tone that was meant to be reproachful oh well your mother is older than we are said rufus promptly i mean for young folks of course some young folks like to go said line there was a girl in our class last summer who said she always went at home and she wouldn't miss going for anything she was so sorry she lived too far away from the church here to go i'll bet you the meetings she was used to were different from ours said rufus positively or else the girl was different from us it was ben who said this half in fun and half in earnest but daisy was wholly in earnest it was clear that she thought ben had given the true reason i'll tell you who i like 
said rufus after a moment's silence and that is the minister who preaches in the gray church do you know him ben miss webster says he is nice and i guess he is but he doesn't seem like a minister somehow i mean a fellow doesn't feel afraid of him he came along one day when we boys were having a snowball frolic he stood and watched us a minute then he took hold and snowballed with us and he made a true aim every time i'd like to hear him preach why don't your folks go there ben it would be so much nearer than where you go why don't your folks said ben rufus laughed and fanny answered for him our folks don't go anywhere most of the time mother is so tired and there is always so much to do besides sunday is the very worst day in a boarding-house the people think they must have a good dinner that day if they don't any other time and the girls have to go out part of the day or they think they are ill-used i don't get to sunday school more than half the time keeping boarders must be hard work said line with sympathy it must be fun though added ben so many different people to get acquainted with and watch how they do things i should think a fellow might learn ever so much in that way there are some nice people come now and then rufus assented there's a man at our house now i guess you'd like he's a writer of some sort letters i guess though people don't hire their letters written for them do they some folks do because men who have lots of letters to answer wouldn't have time to do it themselves that's so but then they couldn't carry them round the country and answer them well i don't know what he does only he writes a great deal and he has a machine to do it with a machine to write with exclaimed both girls at once while ben looked his astonishment in silence yes sir said rufus enjoying the sensation he had made a machine to write with i saw it and heard it it prints just like books and papers i never heard of such a thing said line rufus kedwin are you making fun of us no i'm not it is all true just as i tell you i saw it to-day and asked him lots of questions about it he makes it go like lightning i looked for you fanny to come in and see it but you hadn't got home from the grocery after that i forgot it he says he does all his writing on it and that it is enough sight faster than any pen that ever was made easier to read too he takes it along with him wherever he goes he has a case for it and he carries it in his hand folks think it is a valise he says until he unstraps it sets it on his lap and begins to write then you ought to see them stare he says it is the cunningest thing out i suppose it costs a great deal of money said ben his eyes large and wistful a machine of any sort had a great attraction for him i suppose it does said rufus in a very important tone i don't believe you could guess how much i asked him and i was so scared at what he said that i whistled right out you see it isn't so very large for all it's so cute it didn't seem to me it could take much time to make one when folks once knew how so thinks i to myself like as not it costs as much as twenty dollars ben shook his head and laughed i should say more than that he said without seeing it it must be a new invention and new things always cost a great deal even if they get cheap afterwards i believe i should have guessed as much as fifty dollars the first time well you might said rufus triumphantly and been a good deal out of the way too what do you say to a clean hundred dollars yes sir he added while ben was dumb with astonishment and the girls exclaimed a hundred dollars in good hard money that was what he paid for the thing doesn't it seem tremendous it seems as though a fellow could never afford to have one said ben with a half laugh what in the world would you want of one fanny asked looking at him curiously ben laughed again it couldn't be very easy to tell he said i always feel a hankering after a new machine somehow 
just as you do after a piano you know i never hear of one but i think i would like to own it well but said fanny i could learn to play on a piano if i had one there would be some sense in that so could i learn to play on a machine if i had one ben said quickly meantime rufus was getting ready to answer ben's remark about price i don't know he said if a fellow had the money he could afford to buy one because they earn lots of money writing on them this man says that lawyers and all sorts of business men are having their letters and law papers and things copied on this machine and they pay a great price for it if i only had a machine i'd risk but i could earn my living i know it is an easy thing to learn i'd risk but that i could learn it in less than no time i wrote my name on it he told me i might and it was just as easy the keys go down with a touch he said i might write on it every day and learn how but what's the use in a fellow's doing it when he never expects to have one oh said ben with a long-drawn sigh that was almost a groan what a dreadful dunce you are rufus kedwin how do you know what may happen to you i don't said rufus good-naturedly i may tumble down on my way home and tear a hole in my best clothes i've got on my best ones to-night because i did actually tumble down on my way home from school and got my others all muddy there's no telling what may happen but i'm sure of one thing as i want to be and that is that i haven't got a writing machine and never expect to have one and don't mean to waste my time learning to do a thing that i'll never have a chance to do i only wish i had your chance said ben End of chapter 6